Speak the words Electronic Arts to any recent game fan, and two specific franchises will come to mind. Audiences have a long, troubled relationship with the publishing giant that stems mostly from business practices and unmet expectations. But long before Burnout or even Need for Speed made their debut, EA had another racing franchise. The Road Rash name was around for over a decade, and its demise in 2003 opened the door for all manner of spiritual successors. But when you say the words Road Rash, it's the Sega Genesis fans who perk up. It's hard to remember a time when EA didn't produce their own games, and that's because for a lot of us, it was years before we were born. EA was founded in 1982 by Harvard grad and Apple computer veteran Trip Hawkins, who left a cushy director position at Apple to fill a long-standing dream of creating computer games. Throughout most of the 1980s, the company acted solely as a publisher. But after becoming frustrated with wrangling external game developers, Hawkins gradually shifted the company towards developing games internally instead. Early efforts were focused on the home computer market, but when the 1990s came, so too did the resurgence of the home console. Road Rash released in 1991, exclusively on the Sega Genesis. But curiously, the game's history goes back a bit further. Road Rash was born as an NES racer, and work started with the intent of creating a multidiscipline car racing game, not a motorcycle one. It became rapidly clear to the programmers that the technology EA wanted for the game was well beyond the scope of the NES's capabilities. The game would materialize years later as Mario Andretti Racing, under the now famous EA Sports label, but the original project went on to become Road Rash. Rather than the lap-based racing of the game's original concept, the final product instead sends players on sprawling, point-to-point -point journeys through five Southern Californian locales. Finishing high enough in the pack rewards cash and a qualification for that track, after qualifying for all five stages, the player is promoted to the next level. Each subsequent level's races take place on extended versions of the previous track, while opponents are both faster and meaner. The cash you win from these races can be taken to the bike shop, where players can exchange cash and trading credit for a new set of wheels. There are no licensed motorcycles in this game, allegedly due to the game's highly realistic violence resulting in manufacturers walking away from negotiations. Personally though, I suspect it had a lot more to do with budget. There's little visual distinction between the bikes in the game, and they all take up parody names such as Kamikaze and ZYX. While EA's other 90s racing title became famous for its license to vehicles, Road Rash instead separates itself from other motorcycle racers, like Super Hang On, by adding combat into the mix. One of the Mega Drive's three face buttons is dedicated to throwing a punch towards the nearest opponent. Each rider has a stamina bar that, when drained, will send them tumbling onto the blacktop. Some opponents come ready to fight dirty, wielding bats and clubs, but a properly timed strike allows the player to turn the tide in their favor. Between levels, characters from the race will talk to the player, taunting them or warning them about other riders. This way, the player will know who to avoid, or who to pick a fight with if they want to get their hands on a weapon. Picking a fight can be dangerous though, as you have a health bar just like the rest of the pack, and so does your bike. Thankfully though, one mistake isn't enough to kill you outright. No matter how hard you crash, you'll be given a few chances to hobble back to your bike and try again. But even while on foot, you're still at risk of getting hit by cars or other bikes, or even being arrested by the police. Not many third-party racing games on the Genesis did the pseudo-3D thing well, and those that managed to pull it off usually suffered from pretty poor frame rates. The frame rate is lower than similar games on the Genesis, but in fairness, the game sports much more detailed graphics than its competitors. And despite the low frame rate, the game still manages to feel fast and controllable, though it does get to be quite difficult in higher levels. The game also just looks stunningly good for 1991. There are multiple layers of background effects that scroll in different directions and speeds at the same time, something that would definitely not have been possible on the NES. This look is pretty well remembered too, with some fans maintaining that the pixel look has aged gracefully, at least compared to the digitized sprites and three models of the later games. Also well remembered is the music, and at risk of provoking an angry mob of Genesis fans, I cannot for the life of me figure out why people like this game's music. I like Genesis music, but this? Ugh, this is terrible. Maybe y'all are seeing something I'm not, but I have played this game through a real Genesis Model 2, as well as my Analog Mega SG console, which is a Zero Emulation FPGA solution that features very accurate sound, and neither has sounded anything short of irritating. At the very least, the rest of the sound is decent. More on this later. Road Rash has always stood out to me not only because it's quite impressive for an early Genesis game, but because it was relatively grounded and unique as far as arcade racers go. 
This is one of the very few combat racing games that doesn't involve lasers and missiles, and I think the game is better for it. Road Rash 1 is not a perfect game, mostly thanks to minor quality of life issues. The menus are a bit of a disaster. You can't go to the bike shop from the main menu, there's a button dedicated to swapping players, which I've literally only ever pressed on accident, music is grating and can't be played at the same time as engine sound effects, and perhaps most glaringly, there's no way to quit out of a race and restart without resetting your entire console. Which is a problem, given that this game uses a password save system. With 20 digit passwords. And if that wasn't bad enough, these passcodes both contain the numerical zero and the letter O. Something that gave me a minor heart attack the first time my password came back invalid. I'm sure this has resulted in more than a few lost save games over the years, and dude, come on. There was no way this was necessary. There isn't even enough data in the game to justify 20 character passwords. Road Rash ended up being EA's most profitable game yet, and it got a proper sequel just two years later. But before we get to that, let's talk ports. 1992 saw Road Rash released on the Amiga, as a more or less direct port that featured higher resolution graphics and, thank god, much better music. It makes sense, the Amiga is much more powerful and expensive than a Sega Genesis was. But you guys know me, I like compromised ports. EA had this really strange habit of porting games to Nintendo handheld several years after their home versions released. Did I say had? This is still kind of going on, just with a bigger gap. Road Rash is the first instance of this I've been able to dig up. The Game Boy version of the game is entirely based on the 1991 original. Despite releasing a year after Road Rash 2, the game features none of the sequel's tracks, characters, art, or music. Hello? After discovering that the game refused to boot both in my Game Boy Player and my Game Boy Color, I assumed it was broken and ordered a replacement. Which was promptly lost in the mail. Thankfully, just before I was about to order a third copy of the game, I found out that my original wasn't broken. It's just one of only two titles from the Game Boy's library of 1,056 licensed games that don't work on future models, with the other game being an obscure, forgotten JRPG called Legend Absurd. I had originally wanted to explain why these two specific games were incompatible with later hardware, expecting there to be some wild story behind it, but unfortunately the truth isn't very interesting, and trying to read an explanation written by an emulated developer resulted in my eyes glazing over almost immediately. The short version is that these two games fell victim to an obscure bug in the Game Boy's firmware. On an original DMG Game Boy, these two games work fine. But on the Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, and any emulator that has not programmed the bug into the emulation, both will crash hard and even compatible emulators have issues with flickering and graphical glitches. So that puts me in a strange boat with capturing Road Rash Game Boy from real hardware. I don't have an original Game Boy to point a camera at. And while I could buy a Super Game Boy, which is based on the DMG and thus compatible with Road Rash, I've already got a Game Boy player, which works with literally every other game on the system except an RPG in a language I don't speak. So I've turned to emulation for this one. And upon booting it up, yep, it's Road Rash, and a surprisingly faithful adaptation at that. It plays a bit easier, with fewer hazards and slower opponents. Also, because the Game Boy only has two buttons, compared to the Genesis 3, there's no break button. Simply put, it's a very decent port of the game. That same year, Sega released another 8-bit remake of the game on the Master System and the Game Gear. And my first question is, why is everyone so nice to you in this version? Even the snobby rich dude from all three games acts all cordial. This is the same series that compared my racing seals to a turtle in a body cast. Other than that, it's Road Rash. I'm sure the Game Gear version was impressive for the day, and the Master System version probably holds nostalgia for someone out there, specifically in Europe because it never released this side of the pond, but I'm already playing this on a Genesis. This is definitely a more faithful version of Road Rash, but to me, it's much less interesting than the Game Boy version. Back on the home console front, Road Rash's sequel made its debut in 1993. Road Rash 2 is widely regarded as the best of the three Genesis games, but to tell you the truth, I don't see why. The game runs slower and feels less responsive than the original, leading to the sequel feeling like a downgrade. Which is a shame, because Road Rash 2 takes steps to correct many of the sins that irritated me in the first game. The UI is so, so much better. Passwords are a tolerable length, and the game does look a bit more detailed to boot. In terms of new content, there's a new weapon in the form of the chain, and police are now more threatening. But in truth, it did little to spice up the gameplay. Road Rash 2 just feels like Road Rash 1. I feel really strange saying so little about a game that is widely regarded to be the best of the trilogy, but I don't really have much to say about it that I didn't already say about the first game. It's that similar. If I've missed something major, I'm sorry, but 
but I've spent a lot of time with Red Rash 2 over the last couple of years, and I just don't get it. Almost all of the improvements I've mentioned have more to do with menuing than gameplay, and the ones that do affect gameplay do so in extremely minor ways that don't really justify the game's existence. Flash forward another two years, and the Red Rash franchise is in quite a different spot. 1994 saw the game get a reboot for the Panasonic 3DO, which deserves its own video, so it will get one. EA also put out a Sega CD version, which doesn't, so it won't. The Sega CD version used assets from the 3DO version, including the licensed soundtrack and full motion video. But while the 32-bit version had a brand new engine with 3D environments, the Sega CD didn't. Road Rash 3 for the Genesis and Road Rash for the Sega CD released side by side in March of 1995. And despite all the flashy branding, the Sega CD version was quite literally Road Rash 3, wrapped in the next generation's presentation. On the other hand, Road Rash 3 was a massive leap forward over the previous title. It really goes to show the massive difference between early and late Genesis games. Road Rash 1 is a novel proof of concept. Road Rash 3 is that concept, but fleshed out into a proper game. I've been putting off playing Road Rash 3 for years, because 1, it's starting to get expensive, and 2, everyone told me the first two were better anyway. And I'm sorry, but I have no idea what those people were smoking. While the previous two games sent you mostly through static, repetitive tracks, Road Rash 3's environments are dense and dynamic. Animals run out into the road and get run over, police chase you in cars and set up roadblocks, pedestrians wander into your path, and cars honk at you if you get in the way. There's still only five stages, but each seems to have actual set pieces instead of the same few obstacles lying on the side of the road. These all serve to make the game more interesting and graphically impressive, but they also manage to change the game a fair bit too. Almost all of these things are hazards, making winning even more difficult than it already was. And let me tell you, these games are not easy. You will be trying and retrying a lot here. In addition to the bike shop, there's also an upgrade shop that lets you upgrade your bike to be faster, grippier, and tougher. This is a welcome addition. Given that in previous games, I often felt stuck when my bike was slower than the competition, but I couldn't afford an upgrade without winning. Buying upgrades is much cheaper than getting a completely new set of wheels, and adds some much needed depth to the experience. Also, you can do this now. I think it's supposed to be a melee attack? I don't know, it kinda looks like I'm just striking a sick pose. Road Rash 3 received its own soundtrack, menus, and presentation that are completely unique to the Genesis version. The game was subtitled Tour de Force, and completed the logical progression of scale of the first two games by taking the Road Rashers worldwide. It's still mostly a coat of paint on basic tracks, but for what it's worth, these are the most interesting stages in the series. Without CD audio, Road Rash 3 is yet another traditional Genesis soundtrack. Most tracks sound like a really, really poor attempt to Genesis-size speed metal. <laughs> And Brazil. Jesus Christ. Thankfully, the visuals are a bit better. Like the 32-bit version, Road Rash 3 features digitized sprites that absolutely scream mid-90s, and the environments look decent for the system too. But the biggest art style improvement by far is in the character designs. Zooming out made this game's art a lot easier to look at compared to its predecessors. There are still a couple of pitfalls though. You still can't return to the menu without finishing a race, and the engine noises sound like an electric toothbrush. But overall, it's an improvement on the first two games in almost every way. I don't know why it took four years in a low-effort sequel for EA to actually tweak Road Rash to be a better game. All I can think is that the emergence of new hardware gave them a kick in the ass, forcing EA to ensure that Road Rash 3 wouldn't look like too much of a dinosaur next to its CD-based counterparts. And while it's definitely not a generational leap in terms of fidelity or complexity, third game definitely stood the test of time. For my money, this is the best Road Rash. On the Genesis. While Road Rash 1 got a fair amount of port love, the rest of the franchise has mostly been left out in the cold. Actually, none of the 3D games have been ported to modern systems at all. In 2006, EA released a compilation of classic games on the PSP as EA Replay. It was more or less a bunch of poorly emulated SNES and Genesis games jumped onto a UMD, because it was mid 2000s, and the masses hadn't figured out how easy it is to hack a PSP yet. The game list is actually pretty decent, and includes all three Road Rash games, as well as cult classics like Syndicate. But immediately, things have gone wrong. Many music is missing, which is fine, but the in-game music in all three games has been replaced. Perhaps we're lucky they replaced it with the modern MP3 though, because... God, the sound emulation in this version is the worst I've ever heard. It is intolerably crunchy.
Just do your ears a favor. Other than that, it's a fine way to play the original trilogy, I guess. It always doesn't look as sharp as a modern emulator or my Mega SG, and by default it stretches the picture out to 16.9, which is just... Blech. But turn that off, and you're set. The collection supports save states, so you don't have to remember your password, which is a nice bonus. Overall though, unless you're a Mega purist, and absolutely must play PSP games off of UMDs, you're better off modding your system, installing RetroArch, and emulating these games that way instead. As beloved as the series is, I feel somewhat underwhelmed coming away from this review. I actually think I like this trilogy less than when I started. Finally giving the third game a shot has made me realize how lacking the first two titles really are. Thankfully though, there is plenty more to experience going forward. My most sincere thanks to all of my patrons that make the show possible. By name, thank you so much to Acquire86, Adam Wozniewski, Andre, Andrew Elmore, Ben M, Jesse Scales, Kai M, Caitlin Bowers, Kelly Craven, Mini Me, Mr. W, Rachel, Recent Game Archive, Rabbit the Jaguar, Thibault Renault, and Thunder THR. Every dollar really does count, and in return I throw the occasional bit of extra written content your way, and starting very soon, the first early access for bonus content will make its way to the Patreon. Thank you so much for watching.